But uh, this um, roundtable is um, obviously connected to the installation that is right outside the walls of this lovely museum. Um, in April, Gabby brought the um, collaborated with a noted installation artist and brought the gun violence, the National Gun Violence Memorial to Washington, D.C. He planted 40,000 flowers in the National Mall right in front of the United States Capitol um, to bring the annual cost of gun violence and human lives um, um, in a stark relief to policymakers um, in Washington, D.C. Um, ever since, we have been um, attempting sometimes to tour the country, bringing that message of, you know, one, the devastation of gun violence, but two, also the, the hope that Gabby summons um, that we can, um, you know, combat and then end this national crisis of gun violence. Um, during every one of our memorials, we attempt to uh, highlight um, our coalitions with different groups. So in, you know, um, Washington, obviously, we focused on the action needed from the Biden administration, from Congress. In Philadelphia, we highlighted our uh, vital partnerships with community-led violence inter intervention groups. And here in New York, um, it is entirely appropriate, of course, that we highlight our, um, um, our partnerships with the medical community. Um, Gabby speaks a lot about um, her connections to the doctors and the nurses who um, saved her life after she was shot on January 8, 2011. And in the eight and a half years um, since we've um, uh, founded Giffords and been doing this gun violence prevention work, um, she has uh, um, led the way um, and um, you know, asked for more partnerships with the medical community. Um, because we know at the end of the day, um, your voices are unimpeachable, and when you're speaking to the public, when you're speaking to a patient, um, you speak from um, a, you know, a place and with authority that's unrivaled. Um, so, you know, on behalf of Gabby and Giffords, uh, thank you for you know, um, everything that you as part of the medical community have done, of course, over the past year and a half during COVID, but also for your vital leadership um, to combat gun violence. Um, it is impossible to address the epidemic of gun violence without um, you know, key, you know, key partnerships with the medical community. Um, so I'm Peter Ambler, I'm the co-founder and executive director of Giffords. And why don't we start by having everybody um, in introduce themselves and start with Dr. Sam Jackson. Hi, thank you. I'm Dr. Jackson. I'm a third year psychiatry resident uh, at SUNY Downstate. And I'm representing Doctors for America an advocacy organization made up of about 20,000 physicians of all medical disciplines in, in all 50 states. Um, I'm really, truly honored to be here with you all, and I want to thank um, Congresswoman Giffords. I think it's a really grounding concept to be um, here with this memorial, and it makes me reflect on how my life has been personally affected by gun violence as well. My uncle, who has schizophrenia, was shot by police in the summer of 2000 in his own home after his apartment manager noticed he wasn't doing very well and called for help. Fortunately, he lived, um, but this was sort of my first exposure to how people with serious mental illness get exposed to gun violence. Later on in high school, I grew up in a rural area, and guns are ubiquitous in this area of the country in Michigan. And. Um, Tragically, one of my soccer teammates in high school died by suicide. Um, he shot himself on the fields that I, we grew up playing. Mm -hmm. the, his death, Ben's death, and my uncle's shooting definitely motivated me into a career of medicine, psychiatry, to be an advocate for gun violence prevention um, through safe storage counseling, extreme risk production orders, which I look forward to talking to you guys more about in a little bit. Um, to get involved with DFA and ultimately to be here today. So it's really an honor to be here and to memorialize that step. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Hi, my name is Dr. Nina Agarwal. I'm a child abuse pediatrician in New York City, and I'm representing the New York State American Academy of Pediatrics. 
Um, would you like me to go into? Yeah, well, like, let's start. We'll, we'll go around. Everybody share just like a minute or two. Sort of what brought you here? Sure, sure. What brought me here today are my patients. Um, for the kids um, that I see in clinics in Harlem and the South Bronx who can't sleep at night because of gunshots outside their windows. For the kids whose parents uh, don't, can't let them play outside because they might get caught in a drive-by shooting. Um, there was one particular story that, that um, hit me recently. Um, she was a 21-year-old uh, young black female and she was, I was doing a virtual checkup and her records indicated obesity and um, obesity and insomnia. So I asked her if there were any stressors in her life that would be causing trouble sleeping. She said no. We chatted about 20 minutes into the visit. She said, I'm scared of dying. And I asked her, you know, why? And she didn't you know, tell me initially. It was our first time meeting. And then later she said, uh, I said, are you, are you scared of dying from COVID? She said, no, I'm scared of getting shot. She had had six people in her life that had died from gunshot injuries over the past several months. Um, she added, I grew up near there, near where the shootings occurred. As if to say, it was okay. She was used to it, she could handle it. But her stress eating, her difficulty sleeping, her depression, um, the fact that she hadn't finished um, high school, um, told me she wasn't okay. She was not healthy, she was not thriving. Um, so we talk about keeping children safe in their homes from guns, keeping children safe in their schools from guns. You know, and I'm really happy that uh, Congresswoman Gabby Gifford is talking about keeping children safe in their communities, in between school and home, so they can get safely from point A to point B, because that's what's happening on the streets of, of New York City. Children are living in, in urban war zones. Um, I think the Build Back Better campaign is a step in the right direction towards um, equitable gun violence prevention policy, but I think we need to start earlier in childhood. Um, I think we need to break the cycle of violence earlier. Um, exposure to violence is like exposure to secondhand smoke. Like secondhand smoke can cause um, toxicity to children's lungs and long-term health problems. Exposure to violence in children is toxic to their brains mm -hmm. and their development and possibly cause long-term health problems. Studies have shown they have poor academic performance, high rates of anxiety, high rates of depression, and lower chances of success. So I'm here today because I stand with Gabby Giffords in ensuring that all children, regardless of zip code and skin color, um, have the ability to lead healthy, happy, and safe lives so that we can all sleep at night knowing our kids are safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chapin Sathya. I'm a pediatric trauma surgeon, and I'm the director for the North Wall Health Center for Gun Violence Prevention. Uh, Congresswoman Gabby, you know, Giffords, you've been a true inspiration to everybody across the healthcare field, and I think that goes without saying. Um, my personal journey, you know, unfortunately, I've had to treat far too many children with bullet wounds in this country. Uh, I'm Canadian. My first experience in America was in Chicago. I remember still one of the most vivid stories I have is first week on the job, six-month-old baby came in along with, his, with um, that child's 15-year-old sister, both with bullet wounds. I had just recently had my own daughter. And I still remember this little baby, you know, with the bullet wound through and through, blood gushing out of both sides, fingers on the bullet wounds, and that little baby's eyes rolling back. And, you know, this happened week and week in Chicago, and it's happening more frequently here in New York. I've kept in touch with that family. That baby's now three and a half, not, no longer a baby. And that baby survived. We saved that baby's life, but that baby cannot walk, is paralyzed, and had uh, his spine shattered. So that's a life devastated. You know, over 44,000 Americans die every year, uh, 71,000 non-fatal firearm injuries. So how can we not care about this issue? So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Debbie Mukersel Powell. I was the former congresswoman in Florida's 26th district, which is part of Miami and the Florida. He's full, excited to be now a senior advisor.
all of the aspects of gun violence that we're contending with every day in this country. It that we have this problem that they simply do not have in other countries. It doesn't have to be this way. And so our fight at Giffords and, and particularly the work of my team is really focused on lifting up those solutions for legislators to use, for media to understand better, for the public to be educated, for us to change this debate so that we can actually move in the right direction. Because um, you know what you were saying about all children deserve to be safe, deserve to live, you know, every night being able to sleep in their beds, all of our children across this country, and we can do that. So we're not gonna give up. It's not an easy area and issue to work on for so many reasons, but it is essential. There's really no choice. And so sitting around the table with doctors and with legislators and champions that we've worked with for so long is really a privilege and an honor, and we're so grateful. Uh, we know that for doctors this is important. We also know that your work isn't necessarily always in this sort of field of policy and change, but we can't do it without you. So we're super grateful. Thank you for being here with us today. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, that's actually a good segue because I first also I want to begin first of all by thanking uh, Congresswoman uh, Kippers for your tremendous leadership for inspiring the courage and the, the sort of commitment that, that you've inspired in so many of us, um, but also for the wonderful organization that you built. Yeah. Uh, Peter and Robin and the many people at Kippers really have just been a tremendous resource for all of us who are you know toiling to get. Uh, policy right, to get the laws right, to persuade our colleagues, you know, and understanding some of us get this intuitively, some of us need to be persuaded with, you know, various arguments that have been proven to work in other states. And so it's just been just across the board a tremendous resource for any of us who are working on this. And uh, it is really important that we, I think, one of the big shifts in the conversation in recent years has been the shift toward thinking about gun violence prevention as a public health question. Um, it is, first of all, just, you know, once you hear it and think about it, you realize the intuitive sense of that. Uh, this is a, a problem that, you know, propagates itself in our communities. Um, it is a problem with many causes that can be identified and addressed and mitigated. Um, and it also, if you can get people talking about it as a public health problem rather than a criminal justice problem or, or a restriction of your rights problem, you often can get a different conversation going. Um, I came to this, I, I've been in the legislature now for 15 years. Uh, I was somewhat, uh, I apologize to Canadians. Uh, <laughs> yes, I would have had to apologize for New York at the time. Uh, we had some very poor gun laws and very high rates of uh, gun-related death. And uh, I, so I formed a, a sort of caucus of my colleagues in both houses of the legislature. We actually had some Republicans who joined us on our steering committee. Thought that's been a little harder for them. Uh, but it's, but um, we, uh, in 2013, passed what we call the New York Safe Act, which got New York to sort of the, the sort of top tier of states with with sort of all the, a lot of the basic laws about background checks, <coughs> restrictions on assault weapons, and some other things. Um, but we kept working. Um, I was the prime sponsor of the Extreme Risk Protection Order Bill, which we fought very hard for a number of years for, and got done uh, in 2019. Uh, and New York continues to be working very hard to drive down the rates of gun-related death uh, through, uh, at the city and state level, funding uh, cure violence and other interrupter uh, approaches, making sure our hospitals and trauma centers have uh, intervention programs, and just doing all the things that we know work. Uh, and that, again, I've had the opportunity to learn so much from Gifford's so thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, and thank you so much as well, Congress, um, Congresswoman Giffords, for convening us for the work in your organization um, and the power and the platform that you have to advance this conversation. My name is Dr. Tori Ann Easterling. Uh, I serve as the first Deputy Commissioner and Chief Equity Officer for one of the largest public health agencies, the New York City Health Department. I'm also here representing Big Cities Health Coalition as we are a member organization. And so I'm here in wearing both hats because we are, as I'm just to borrow uh, Senator Kavanaugh's uh, words, we're here to say that this is a public health emergency uh, and we have to put forward a public health approach. Um, we have seen what we can do when we put forward a public health approach to address a public health emergency. We're in a generational pandemic uh, and it is time that we do the same towards addressing violence. 
uh, making sure that we are using our data sensible uh, in a way that we can communicate clearly what are the needs that we have, coming up with both prevention and treatment measures, but also making sure that we have uh, a social model uh, that we can really move upstream and make sure that we're getting to the needs that we know uh, lead to the outcomes that we are seeing. Um, there was a point in New York City uh, where we were the epicenter of this pandemic that we are experiencing right now. We were also at a point where we were seeing more shootings uh, in this city uh, than we were having COVID deaths. Uh, and so we know how we can respond to a public health emergency uh, and that we need to do the same around violence prevention. And so I think it's really important that we have this conversation and really happy to hear that there are uh, other conversations that are happening with community partners and many others because it, it does need a collective approach. My name is Kirsten Stewart, and I'm with Futures Without Violence. And I want to also thank you so much for including us, including us in the memorial and including us in this event. Um, we also believe violence is preventable, and that's why we're so eager to partner with you. And, and, and so appreciate um, the hard, sometimes one, optimism that we can do this. And so when you ask why we're here, I, I'm here for the four to five women every day who are murdered by their intimate partners um, and the children who often are sometimes also killed or often grow up in their lives without both their parents um, because of gun violence. Um, we know domestic violence, um, you know, we say what, what could be a black eye becomes a body bag when there's a gun involved. You're five times more likely to be killed by domestic violence when there's a gun in the home. And so we know how critical and how important it is to address the intersection of gun violence and intimate partner violence. Uh, and we also, as I said, we, we feel optimistic that there is a time, we are in a time now, in part, so many parts because of your leadership, that we can make a difference. So we're working on the Violence Against Women Act right now to try to get some um, gun violence legislation passed around closing what we call the, the boyfriend loophole. Uh, which we we have some hope, <laughs> which I can't always say we've had, but we do. And you know, the Biden administration, we're looking at billions of dollars in the reconciliation package for gun violence prevention. Uh, and so our focus at Futures has also been really exactly this point we've talked about. How do we turn gun violence into a public health issue? Take a public health approach. Look at trauma and children. Look at how people get access to guns and how we can use the law and policy um, to keep guns out of the hands of people who have already been demonstrated that they will use violence. Um, so thank you again. I'm uh, Doug DeLong. I'm uh, here representing the American College of Physicians, a group of about 160,000 physicians uh, and students. Um, I don't know that I can say anything more complimentary about the, uh, Congresswoman Giffords that has already been said, but it's not very often you get to be in the same room as one of your personal heroes. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I want to thank the staff, too. I know nothing happens in organizations like this without an incredible staff. So thank you to the staff as well. Um, why am I here? I think it's two, two things, perhaps. Um, uh, I was very fortunate in my professional career uh, that the stars were in alignment and I was able to proceed through the leadership ranks of the American College of Physicians. And uh, during that time, I was able to also participate uh, in writing healthcare policy. The college has been very active uh, uh, in addressing gun violence for at least three decades, uh, addressing it as a public health issue, as we've heard about, working with many other uh, medical uh, groups and communities, and the uh, interesting, the American Bar Association. So I have some uh, uh, experience writing policy. But I think. I'm really here because of David. Um, David was an 80-year-old patient of mine, basically healthy, um, who uh, his wife came in one morning and told me that he had shot himself uh, in their home with a handgun. And I think that started my personal journey uh, regarding gun violence and gun violence pretend, uh, prevention. So. And thanks again for having me. Thank you. Um, you know, Gabby, at your shooting um, obviously shocked the country. Um, you know. What? 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 Chicken, chicken, chicken. Mm -hmm. Chicken, chicken, chicken. Chicken, chicken, chicken. So for weeks after Gabby was shot, when she um, started her um, therapy, all you know, she, she suffers from aphasia, and all she could say is what, 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 chicken, chicken, chicken. There was something about toast, right? Um, and um, 
but you know that was you know for for um, you know, fortunately not an end. You, you survived an assassin's bullet, and it was the beginning the beginning of a remarkable recovery that um, obviously involved um, you know the miracle working of you know a surgical team, the care of nurses and other medical professionals, and you know thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours working with um, you know people on your rehabilitation. Um, do you, do you, have, you have thoughts that you'd like to share, um, sort of that, you know, um, look at how far you've come on your rehabilitation and your um, ongoing fight to stop gun violence? Um, save lives. Save lives. Yeah. And, um, and you've you know, worked on some remarks, right? The longest that you've ever um, given. How, how, how long have you spent giving them? Yes. Yeah. Um, one year. It's been a year working on them. Would you like to share some of those thoughts? I've known the darkest of days, days of pain and uncertain recovery, but confronted by despair adds summons hope. Confronted by paralysis and aphasia, I respond with grit and determination. I put one foot in from the other. I found one word and then I found another. My recovery is a daily fight, but fighting makes me stronger. Words once came easily today. I struggle to speak, but I've not lost my voice. America needs all us to speak out, even when you have to fight to find the words. I'm also in a second fight, the fight to stop gun violence. It's also a fight forged by tragedy and pain, a fight that can change lives. We are at a crossroads. We can let the shooting continue, or we can act. We can protect our families, our future. We can vote. We can be on the right of the history. Please join us in this fight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabby. <laughs> um, there's the old, did you, did you all see the, the, the Biden elbow yeah. bump from yeah. 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 Um So, Robin, let's uh, start with you. Um, uh, this is a um, epidemic that has cost this nation, you know, um, you know, tens of thousands of lives every, every year for as long as I've been working on this. So, we've seen recent spikes. Um, can you sort of set the table for our conversation? Um, some FBI data came out. Um, what, what, what are we seeing in this country right now on gun violence? Yeah, so for a long time, back in the 90s, it was a, a sort of an all-time high. And with a number of measures that were put in place, it began to decline. And it went down to about 30,000 gun deaths a year and stayed relatively static there for quite some time. And there were more promising measures being developed. States like California, um, Brian was talking about past really comprehensive legislation over time, and that provided an opportunity for other states to follow suit. And in states like California, and now in New York, where you have comprehensive regulation, you saw declining rates of gun violence and gun death. So it was really an exciting realization that comprehensive regulation could actually have an impact. Um, and we are work, especially after the tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary School, more so after Parkland, was to provide incentive for legislators to take action and inevitably to push for federal reform. Unfortunately, even in the years before um, the COVID epidemic took over, we saw gun violence starting to increase again. And some of that is certainly related to increasing gun ownership. And during COVID, that really skyrocketed. So you had this really horrendous confluence in the last two years of increased rates of gun ownership, 50 million new gun owners or new gun purchases during the last year and a half. Um, programs that have been mentioned at the table, community violence intervention models, which focus on um, deterrence at the community and grassroots level, rely upon things like street outreach workers being able to access the communities and get social services to people. Things like domestic violence that Kirsten was mentioning have skyrocketed in the last two years. Um, accidents in children, having so many children at home with you know, almost two million loaded unsecured weapons in the home led to increased rates of accidents. So we're sort of seeing, uh, on the whole, I believe we're up to above 
40,000 gun deaths in the last take, which is about 15% higher than the year before and about 25% higher than two years ago. We're cycling up. And it's a little bit difficult to sort of countenance that. And I think for those of us who work on this issue, I know for doctors who are seeing it, it's really hard to absorb this change. And on the upside, because we have to turn towards the hope, you know, this is the moment. If there's ever a moment for those people in charge of this country, individuals who have the capacity to make change, seeing the increases now makes it that much more urgent. You know, we simply can't do nothing. And, you know, even the amount we're able to do at the state level, which is which allows us to have those successes, which enables us to count the ways in which good, strong, comprehensive laws and policies work, um, can't work alone at the state level. Even if New York passes the best laws in the country, not quite as good as California, but you can't do it. You guys are doing a great job. You're like number three, right? <laughs> You're catching up. You're getting an A minus. You got it on our, on our report card, sorry. You guys did better. Um, <laughs> You know, New York State, when they look at where the crime guns are coming from, used in the state, it's up the iron pipeline from all of these states, mostly in the South, where they have much weaker gun laws. You don't need a background check. You can buy multiple assault weapons and drive them up to New York and sell them here. So it really does require comprehensive federal reform, as well as what we're doing at the state level. So with that... I'll sort of open it up, but the but the picture here is that you know we have models in the states. We are making progress in many places. We've passed more than 400 laws at the state level since the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School when Gabby and Peter founded what was then Americans for Responsible Solutions. We've had tremendous success in educating and passing these laws, but it's not going to be enough until we have federal reform, until we have it across the country. Um, and I think that this last two years has really hopefully surface this issue in a way that forces action. It used to be much more third rail, and I think today it's not. It's yeah. an issue that is a kitchen table issue, which Gabby and Peter talk a lot about. Absolutely. Um, so I think that's a, a wonderful you know, sort of high-level national per perspective. Dr. Easterling, you work um, at the local level, at a big local level, um, the biggest city in the United States. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, we talk about um, gun violence as a public health emergency. Um, it's been declared as such here in New York. So what is the role of like, local health departments in uh, helping understand and confront gun violence? Yeah, very good question, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, you know, so uh, in naming uh, uh, gun violence as a public health emergency, uh, we certainly have to make sure that we have the data. And, you know, you've already heard uh, some of the numbers that are that we're grappling with now, and um, when we talk about data, it's not just sharing those numbers, but it's also making sure that we're framing it in a way that people understand, um, and really bringing those stories up from the community level, because people connect and they they understand how they need to be activated. Um, but we also talk about uh, in New York City that your zip code should not determine your health status, and quite often in New York City we see the tale of two cities. Uh, where uh, you know where you live certainly dictates the the health outcomes, but not just those health outcomes, social and, and environmental and educational as well. So there there's a need for us to reframe this as a much broader prevention strategy that we need, and making sure that we understand that these outcomes are often driven um, by social structural issues, and we have to address them as part of our fight to address gun violence. Um, you've already heard something about uh, the Community Violence Interruptive Program. Really have an expansive, one of the most expansive for a large city is New York City. Certainly it started in Chicago, but um, we have a cure violence program that's grounded by uh, our uh, crisis management system. Um, it's not just deploying uh, interrupters, it's the wraparound services, it's the coordinated referral services, it's the capacity building that we do with all the community-based organizations. So we're not just sending out individuals who have the lived experiences, but we know that pastors and rabbis and imams are often the ones that are receiving a lot of this information. How are they building that capacity? Um, and I think it's also making sure that our hospitals are prepared because we know that they are often the single access point to receiving a lot of the violence outcomes. Uh, and we know that many of our hospitals need to be prepared to be able to reduce uh, them and, and raise And so these are the ways in which our health department has really uh, made sure to be part of the conversation in this reframe about how we address violence. That's fascinating. Um, Dr. Adwal, um, you know, uh, gun violence against children, it tends to be one of the sort of most galvanizing um, things in this country, right? When children are shot, you know, politics 
some, like sometimes at least sort of you know turn into action. Um, but the you know, too often the um, uh, the, the injuries that uh, children suffer from gun violence are physical. Um, and you had sort of started talking about this a little bit earlier, but I'd love for you to expound on the epidemic of trauma that infects children in whole communities from exposure to gun violence and what the sort of second, third order effects of that are. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for, um, you know, raising the... the issue of exposure to violence in children and how that has um, severe consequences. Children are exposed to violence more likely to become victims and perpetrators of gun violence. So what can we do earlier on in childhood to, to stem, um, stem uh, or mitigate the risk of them becoming victims and perpetrators? Um, you know, I, I have housing projects near me, and I've gone into those housing projects through the pandemic. We've had shootings. This is unusual. And I've gone in there, and I've asked them, what, you know, what is the problem? What are the solutions? You know, I feel like we need to go to the communities. We need to ask them for the solutions. We clearly don't have them. You know, they're experiencing it. Um, you know, what do they see as a solution? And what I've heard From, from the families is, you know, they want after-school programs. They want the kids off the streets. They want mentorship programs. You know, we tell kids to put down a gun, but why did they pick it up to begin with? You know, it's not, they didn't, you know, grow up, or they didn't, they weren't born wanting to carry a gun, right? They were forced to do that. It was a, a, a way of survival. So I think we need to broaden how we look at gun violence, kind of like what Dr. Easterling was saying. So we need to look at it, not just the, the deaths, but the non-fatal injuries, um, most um, the, the CDC's data only captures death. It doesn't capture non-fatal injuries. Most suicide, uh, firearm-related suicide, ends in death. But that doesn't happen the same with, with attempted homicide. So we're missing a big, big chunk of injuries, and those are like the drive-by shootings. more that we don't have that top-down buy-in. And I think when our CEO, Michael Dowling, took a big stance on this in December 2019, it very much reverber like reverberated across the entire country. Believe it or not, we couldn't get almost any other large health system CEOs to be vocal on this. We tried. You know, Michael Dowling, other CEOs, they have very close connections. We talked to many, including you know, some of the biggest health systems in the country, and they didn't find this to be a priority institution. And that creates a problem for many of us when it comes to funding of the initiatives that we want in our own hospitals or culture change within an organization, right? It's, it's, it's no secret that even within healthcare, there's a lot of disagreement as to whether or not this is a healthcare issue, right? We're finding that in our research right now where we're rolling out universal screening, asking every patient who comes into our hospitals questions around firearm injury risk, both violence risk and safety risk. Uh, we're finding that many don't agree, just like they don't agree about vaccine mandates, yeah. right? This is a common, common thing. So that leadership is um, just incredible if we have that within the healthcare industry. And you can imagine if that we coalesce at all levels of the healthcare industry, the impact that we can have kind of nationally, right? Not just providers, but as really those who will lobby and make those decisions nationally, locally, regionally. Um, we uh, do do a lot of research funded by the NIH, uh, and we did launch a learning collaborative in April uh, for hospitals and health systems on this topic, with monthly sessions, action-oriented collaborative, 
where health systems across the country are actually pledging to implement strategies to reduce firearm injury yeah. at a system level. We started off with two CEOs, now we have 35 thousands of providers, 400 hospitals from 35 states. So it's really a building kind of coalition and it, it's really in big part thanks to your efforts um, you know, and us kind of coming together. A lot of these hospitals have never done anything in this space. They're from rural communities, they don't know where to start. And you know we have a lot to learn. Like we have a lot to learn from Dr. Agarwal's work, um, you know, and other people's work here. So I think that sense of community is really important. We and I think we need to celebrate this whole coalition because for 25 years the NRA blocked uh, research at the federal level into gun violence and gun violence prevention um, simply because they didn't want to know the answers. But thanks to a powerful coalition consisting of everybody in this room, we're um, able, hopefully. Um, over the next uh, you know, several months to appropriate $100 million between the CDC and the NIH um, over in a three-year period for um, research that's already, already being done on the ground um, right here in New York and all, all across the country. Um, let's uh, um, transition, sort of dig into sort of different parts of the problem. Um, Dr. DeLong, you, um, uh, you know, are in a you know, Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame or rural part of, the, of New York State. Um, um, something struck me about the sort of FBI data that Robin was talking about, you know, this 30% spike in murders, um, which was driven almost exclusively by firearms violence, um, that you saw it wasn't isolated just to big cities. You saw that these increases spread out between you know small county cities and everybody in between. more than one traffic light. I think this brings a couple of things uh, uh, to the table f for me personally. Uh, one is As though I, I did not grow up around guns, uh, but having lived in such a rural atmosphere all of my professional career, I've gained a much different perspective of the culture around guns. And in fact, Uh, I am a gun owner and I am somewhat of a low-grade hunter. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, the, the David was the one who really was a catalyst in my action. And gun suicide is really, the, uh, the, the I think, is ignored, it's silent. We, we, the headlines are always about mass shootings and tragedies with children and uh, urban violence. But you know, everyone at this table, I think, knows that actually suicides are, you know, 60 percent of gun fat fatalities of, uh, from gun violence. Um, and so um, uh, my efforts have in the rural areas, uh, I, I really am the face of gun violence in rural America. Older, white, male, rural gun owner. Uh, I, I'm it. Um, so that, that's been my emphasis and I've done a lot of we're trying to uh, educate physicians. Physicians are very interested. They, they get that this is a public health issue, but most physicians are, really have not had any education about firearms themselves. You know, the difference between a rifle and a shotgun or a handgun or caliber or rifling or just anything. And they just really do not have to answer that. So I personally have been spending a lot of time uh, in education, doing grand rounds uh, in various uh, venues and also uh, some uh, YouTubes uh, on, if you go to uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine, they have a media section where uh, they have a, a, a group called um, um, uh, the Consult Guys, and it's a little, couple of little vignettes, and I've done a couple now on gun violence. So in rural America, um, gun violence is really suicide. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, Robin has always, you know, spoken very sort of, you know, persuasively about this sort of she calls the myth of inevitability, right? This idea 
that um, you know if somebody attempts if somebody attempts suicide at a certain point that they're sort of is something that they made up their minds about when in fact it's an impulsive act that's often it's very much yeah. an impulsive act yeah. we, we know that you know unfortunately if you're going to use a gun you're very likely to be successful with more than 90 percent success rate but we also know that for individuals who attempt suicide the vast majority of them do not die by by suicide. So it is an impulsive act, and we have, as physicians, particularly primary care physicians in rural America, you know, that's our opportunity to act, to screen, to counsel. So, um, Kirsten, um, October is, of course, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, and uh, the nexus between firearms violence and domestic violence is um, incredibly deadly, and as you said, drives a lot of the mortality that we see from domestic violence. Um, can, can you talk about you know, um, partnerships that you and um, your uh, you know, colleagues at Futures have had with the healthcare industry and where you've had success working on uh, preventing domestic violence and perhaps what the gun violence space can learn from that? Absolutely. And uh, as you said, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And one of the things I always like to lead off with is uh, a little, as I said, a little boost of, of hope and optimism, which is that we've actually reduced domestic violence by two-thirds in this country um, after the passage of the Violence Against Women Act. Public policy can make a difference, right? We actually can prevent violence. And so I always like to lead off with that. Um, and it comes from taking a science-based, evidence-based approach that says what are the drivers of this violence and how do we impact those. So um, we also, we house the National Health Resource Center on domestic violence. We work um, daily with healthcare providers. Um, so basic screening, things that I've, I've heard my healthcare colleagues talk about. Um, ask the question about what's going on at home. Um, start identifying, uh, you know, we ask a slightly different question in the domestic violence space, which is, you know, some derivation of, you know, how do you, do you feel safe at home? Um, if not, why not? And, and we can start having a conversation. And, and as much as possible, we, we try not to do checklists. We don't recommend it, just sort of a checklist screening box, but really a conversation. And through the healthcare partnerships, we've been able to identify, um, you know, usually in this case, it's most often women, but there's domestic violence in all types of relationships. Um, where women will start to say why they feel afraid. And, um, you know, there are laws right now on the books that if you are convicted of a domestic violence, even a misdemeanor, or if there's a protective order against you, you cannot have a firearm. And those laws have worked in places where those laws are enforced, where gun retrieval takes place. Again, after someone either has a protective order against them or has been convicted of a crime, um, you can have the guns taken away, and it does reduce violence. Um, so that's one really good example. I think the other two places where we're really going forward and, and would really welcome partnership is um, looking at norms of masculinity. Uh, we don't talk enough, frankly, about the fact that most perpetrators of violence, including self-directed violence, are men. And it is often, and young men in some cases, older men in other cases, and it is often about that loss of power and control, which is a core understanding of domestic violence work, but what we now understand in a lot of, of when we look at community violence and, and young men's violence, and, and even folks who are contemplating suicide, it is that sense of, of loss of power and control. And, and why do it seem more often than not, and men more often than women, engage in the use of violence and engage in guns violence in particular? <laughs> So that's something we, we look forward to seeing more research on. That's great. Now let's start talking a little bit about solutions to gun violence and then how we sort of get those. Dr. Jackson, I'm going to pivot over to you. You know, you do a lot of work, um, you and your organization, on safe storage and extreme risk laws. Um, can, you, can you just sort of um, briefly describe the importance of those and how they can help save lives? Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, I'd like to lead up by telling a story about a patient. Um, a gentleman I'll call Wayne, even though that is not his, his real name. He's in his 40s, lives with his, lives with his mom, and suffers from schizophrenia. Uh, the pandemic was really hard on him because he attended a lot of group day uh, treatment facility sessions, which really engaged him. But over the pandemic, that all turned virtual, and he couldn't really engage. He went off his medications and became very paranoid, which is commonly how his illness presents. He started stockpiling knives, and then when his mother found the knives and asked him, he told her that he no longer wanted to live. So he was brought to the hospital and admitted involuntarily, got treatment, and does better, because he does better on medication. However, in addition to the paranoia, insight into his illness is a lifelong struggle. 
And the reason why taking care of him now, I can sleep pretty well at night, is knowing that because of the work by Senator Kavanaugh and the New York Safe Act, um, I can make sure that he does not have lim um, legal access to a firearm. <coughs> so under the extreme risk protection orders, under the SAFE Act, um, psychiatrists, healthcare workers, who have a, with a reasonable degree of certainty that this person is a high risk for violence, um, we can limit and we can make sure that they don't have legal access. Um, what does keep me up at night is knowing how few physicians even know that these tools exist. Yeah. They're intuitive, they're cheap, they're life-saving, but a lot of people don't even know that they're at their disposal. Yeah, extremist laws, you know, there's been research that's come out that's shown that um, it has a potential for every 10 extreme risk orders issued, you can save one life, which is, you know, very efficient sort of bang for your buck from a public policy standpoint. Exactly, and if you compare that number to colonoscopies, so colonoscopy is widely accepted as an excellent screening tool to present, uh, to prevent a death by colon cancer, the number needed to screen is 450. For mammograms, it's 570. For herbos, it's 1020. Yeah. So yeah, I want to sort of now I'm sort of move us towards like right. So um, I want to provide a little hope, and I think um, so. Kevin, you, you provide a little hope. It's sort of it's you know sometimes you know people say like oh New York has gun laws. Oh of course it's a blue state. They've got they've got they've got good good gun laws. They say the same thing about California, but it wasn't always like that. Um, you ran for Congress uh, for for the state legislature ri originally um, in part to um, correct what you saw. Uh, was a deficit in the gun laws here. So, like, thinking of it as sort of a model for what potentially we can do nationally, um, how did you um, take on sort of hopelessness? How did you take on uh, the gun lobby and ultimately, um, you know, uh, strengthen New York State's gun laws? Yeah, it's, it's, I think that, um, I mean, first of all, it's, I think the movement has come a long way, and I think that most legislatures in America, I, I've worked uh, in a using the New York model of getting a caucus together, we've actually created a, a 50 state legislative caucus and we've had a few, we've had five conferences with Givers help uh, to get legislators from around the country to talk about these issues and learn about them. So there are now legislators in every state legislature that uh, want to do something about this and are aware that there are solutions, uh, but it does take, it takes real organizing and it takes um, overcoming this sense that you know, it is inevitable that this issue is, you know, I, I think Peter used the phrase third rail before, which it, it, I think it used to be even in places like New York. There was no political benefit to taking up. You were unlikely to be successful in really changing the laws. And so, you know, put your, put your efforts into other things. Um, I think there's an awareness now uh, because a number of states now have passed uh, successful laws. Um, extreme protection orders have now, you know, swept many across many states and again are being proven effective uh, but you need to keep organizing um, even within legislatures uh, you need to make sure you're getting you know uh, physicians and, and other medical professionals but also you know the full range of people uh, in our communities that are concerned about this that have expertise uh, to bring to bear and you also need to make sure you follow through so our extreme risk order um, you know, we passed in 2019. Uh, we were planning on doing a kind of uh, year in how's it going uh, thing, which was disrupted by, I mean, by COVID directly and by the fact that the courts were very substantially shut down uh, during COVID. Uh, but we do; we, it has been variable across the state. So you can you can continue to do like if you're if you're a legislator, you can pass laws. If you pass laws, you can follow through and make sure people are aware of them, make sure they're working effectively, and you can continue to learn. Uh, the steps that other states and other jurisdictions are taking that are improving effective. And I, and I think in particular there's a growing awareness that intervention strategies, resources in communities are an untapped opportunity in many places. We've actually done a lot of that in New York at, at the city level, an extraordinary amount of them, and then at the state level trying to make sure that communities around the state have access to those resources. But there's still a lot of opportunity across the country, and that's something you can typically get consensus on without a big statewide consensus. Cities can do it, localities can do it. So there's a lot, a lot of great work to be done and a lot of, I think a lot of reason for optimism in spite of, you know, the, there's been a, we've moved in, in a, you know, negative direction the last couple of years, but 
uh, over the long term trend we are you know moving in the right direction and addressing this. That's a great path forward. So Debbie, I'm gonna um, uh, sort of close it out with, with with you. As a member of Congress, well as a candidate you ran on gun safety. Um, you know and uh, you know, people were skeptical that uh, you know Democrats in competitive districts could you know make gun safety a winning issue. You did, um, as did many of your colleagues in 2018. And then, as a congresswoman, you passed personal background checks, HRA, and uh, you know advocated and sort of um, advanced other um, gun safety issues. Um, so now, from your uh, vantage point as a Congress watcher. <laughs> um, where do we go now? Uh, the House has, for the second time, passed universal background checks. Um, we have uh, five billion dollars in um, the Build Back Better Act. Um, what do um, Americans writ large need to do to, um, um, you know, try and push this agenda forward and actually get something done? Well, um, we all know that policies do work, especially at the federal level. It's really difficult to work on different in different communities preventing gun violence when uh, we are allowed to have gun trafficking coming into states that have very strict gun laws. So, I mean, there's a lot that we need and we must do at the federal level. We have to start by passing the universal background check bill. I mean, this is a unifying issue. This is the issue where Republicans, Democrats, and independents come together. More than 90% of Americans understand that this is a bill that will protect our children. Just today, we heard of the terrible news that there was an active shooter in a school in Arlington, Texas. We can't continue to wake up to these news. We can't continue to normalize what is happening with violence in our communities, the suicide rates, which are extremely high in, in the Keys. It's, they have some of the highest uh, suicide rates in the entire state of Florida. There's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of pain. We have to put pressure in the Senate right now because I can tell you in the House of Representatives we have many champions like Representative McBath, um, Congressman Adam Schiff, who actually uh, for another Congress is sponsoring the, the repealing PLACA, which the gun industry, as you know, is the only protected industry in this country where um, they are not liable for any of the violence that we see in this country. There are many bills like the extreme risk um, law bill that has passed here in the state of uh, New York, but also in the state of Florida. We don't have that at the federal level yet. So if we can do it in a Republican state like the state of Florida, we can do it at the federal level. There, there needs to be courage. We need to demand courage. Um, and I think it's going to take all of us together understanding that it is a public health issue and that as voters, we have the power to put the people in elected office that are going to take action. And we started, and, and I do want to end it in a positive note, because no one thought we were going to be able to do this. And in 2018, we won. In 2019, we passed the first piece of legislation in more than 20 years, gun safety legislation, thanks to uh, Gabby and her efforts to bring HRA to the floor. Thanks to Peter and the team, like you said, it was also a huge resource for me and my staff in, in my office. Um, and that's what we need, and that's why we continue to do this work. And in some ways, I feel much more effective doing it, working with Gabby and Peter um, and Robin than I do in Congress, because at least we're educating, and, and having these forums are so important and critical to make sure that people are aware of the things that we need to do. So call your senators, if you're watching, right now. <laughs> um, and for those in person, I speak in courage, um, if not maybe those at home for now, we put a little, little pin here, and I don't know if you noticed Gabby's brooch there, but she didn't leave the house without it. Um, it's uh, by a noted uh, Tucson artist. Uh, Peterson. P Peterson, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, personifies for Gabby and for us courage and, you know, the beauty of the struggle. Um, so, you know, everybody sort of take this pain and know that you're always then close to Gabby's heart because that, <laughs> um, uh, that, that, that brooch is always close to Gabby's heart. But I think, um, you know, thank you everybody. Gabby, um, before we, we, we wrap up on a sort of like lighter note, it's been a, a long pandemic. Um, uh, you know, it's, this is a you know, long fight. You like to say it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so uh, how do you, like over the pandemic, how, how have you been keeping yourself busy? I'm so busy. <laughs> a lot of Zoom calls. <laughs> work, work, work. Yoga twice a week. French horn, Spanish lessons, ride my bike, um, gym, all over again, all over again. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and uh, so um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm lucky if I make it to the captain. Not that, not um, but you know, it's uh, like I said, really a real honor to be here with everybody. Um, I appreciate sort of uh, exceedingly that after. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.